Hello and welcome to Lecture 4 of the Principle of Relativity in Phys 1104. And in this lecture we're going to meet a very useful problem-solving tool called the Zero Momentum Reference Frame. Suppose you need to keep track of the location of a crowd of people, right? And maybe they're staying together as a crowd, perhaps they're all going to a concert or something, and you're the concert organizers, so you need to make decisions about where first aid personnel and people selling t-shirts are. So you could just keep track of all the individual position vectors of the people, but that's way too much work and totally unnecessary. What you could do is take an average of all those position vectors and get a single position vector that points more more or less at the center of the crowd. So you might call it the center of mob, right? CM, or so the vector is now the RCM. And of course, if the crowd is forced to split up to go around some sort of a barrier, you can easily end up in the situation where RCM points at a location where there's no one even close to it, but it is still identifying the middle of the crowd. And this, the mob moves, so the center of mob will move, and so you can define a center of mob velocity. And one thing to notice is that the center of mob's motion is going to tend to be much simpler than the motions of the individual people, because in the averaging process, the complexities of their motions will tend to cancel out. Let's apply this idea of an average position to a nice clean physical system instead of a messy complicated thing like a crowd of people. So here's a familiar collision that we've looked at before and from the video analysis data I've pulled out the x components of position at some time, right? And we only care here about the x components of position because these carts are moving parallel to the x axis. So let us find the x component of the, well, it's not the center of mob position. We'll talk about what we actually call it in a moment. So it's tempting just to go and do a straight average of these, but wait a second, that hardly seems fair because there are actually two carts over here, aren't there? So I'd better do XA plus, and then there are two carts here, so I'll just say 2XB, and now I've just averaged positions of three carts, so I'd better divide by three. And if you plug that into your calculator, you'll find that it's 0.44 meters. And for once, I kind of care about this number because there's something interesting about it. Look, it's 0.24 meters from card A, and it's 0.12 meters from B. So it's twice as far from A, and A has half the inertia. That's interesting. So that's a clue as to what's going on here. Really, we've just done a weighted average of these positions where our weighting factor is the inertias, right? Cart A is a standard cart, and so there's the standard cart inertia. And then cart B is two standard carts. And then we're dividing by how many standard carts we have, which means if they hadn't been standard carts or a ratio of 1 to 2, I could just do whatever the inertia of A is times XA and whatever the inertia of B is and XB, all divided by the total inertia of the system. And so this is, well, it would be nice since it's um, weighted according to inertia to call it a center of inertia position, but in fact no one will know what you mean if you say that. Everybody calls it the center of mass position. And so we'll bow to peer pressure and go with the standard usage of language and call this a center of mass position. I can have the video analysis software calculate the position of the center of mass. You can see it uh, right there in that little green dot, and as the motion goes, you can tell that it's moving with constant velocity, even through the collision where the carts don't move with constant velocity. And you can see in the position versus time graph of the center of mass here that it's moving with constant velocity. To show you that it's important that we properly weight the average according to the inertias, here's what happens when you don't do that so that the incorrectly calculated center of mass is just halfway between the carts, and then you can see that the center of mass does not move with constant velocity. 
What will work for two objects will work for any number. We just have to carry out this weighted average over all of the position vectors of all of the objects, and we can write that more compactly with a summation notation. And we've already seen that the center of mass moves with constant velocity, so just note that is much simpler than the motion of the individual objects in the system. And that makes the center of mass an inertial reference frame, which seems like it would be useful. So wouldn't it be nice to be able to calculate the center of mass velocity? Well, we know how to do that already. We already know the position, and it's a function of time. So we just take the time derivative, and now all of these dr by dt's up here are just the velocity vectors of the individual objects in the system. If you look back at the data that we had for the two colliding carts, where we could view it from the Earth frame and from a camera on another moving cart, there's an interesting feature in the data, but you kind of have to dig to see it. If you multiply the velocities by the masses so that you get momentum versus time graphs, you can see how the momentum versus time graph in the moving frame is just shifted relative to the Earth frame, but also the two curves are shifted relative to each other. And also, if you compare the, the system momentum in the two, you see that the system momentum in the Earth frame was 1.25 kilogram meters per second, and in the moving frame, it comes out to 0.67 kilogram meters per second. Well, I don't care about the numbers, but notice that we can change the system momentum by looking at a different frame. So presumably there is some frame that we could choose where the graph would look like this, and the system momentum would be zero. Now, we don't know at the moment how fast the other moving cart with the camera on it would have to be moving for us to see this, but presumably such a frame exists. And it turns out to be useful, so now I'm going to work a problem to show you why it's useful. Here's the problem I'm going to work, and it's sort of like one from Unit 5, but with a twist that makes it considerably more difficult. But we're going to see an easy way to do it. So we've got our two carts approaching each other, and one of them has a spring on it that's already compressed. It's being perhaps held by some sort of a hair trigger. And when the two carts collide, spring, the spring uncompresses and the carts are pushed apart at a higher relative speed than they started. So this is going to be an explosive separation, but an explosive separation where the relative speed before the collision is non-zero. So how would we go about solving this using methods that we know from units four and five? Well, we would probably start with the conservation of the x component of momentum, and here's what it looks like. So far, so good. Then what? Well, we might try the x component of relative velocity. It was awfully convenient in elastic collisions and even in inelastic ones, right? So the x component of the relative velocity just changes sign and gets multiplied by a coefficient of restitution e. But here's where we hit our first barrier. We don't know the coefficient of restitution. It's a explosive separation, so we know it's bigger than 1. But that's all we know about it. So all that equation does is get us another unknown. That's no good, so let's get rid of it. So the next thing we would probably try is conservation of energy. So there's the conservation of energy for this system, right? We've got uh, an, in an initial kinetic energy for one cart and for the other cart, the spring energy and so on, and then just the kinetic energies at the end. And so now, we'd, now we would go about doing the algebra, right? We would probably take this, and we would solve it maybe for this. Solve for that one velocity. And we would now plug this in down here to eliminate VBFX. And we would solve for VAFX. But wow, that is going to be a pain in the butt to solve, right? It's going to be a big, horrible quadratic. Now, you shouldn't be afraid of quadratics. They're not so bad. But this one is particularly icky. You could throw it into maple. It would look like this. And you can see it comes down to, of course, two solutions because we're solving a quadratic. And so you'd have to think about those. But wouldn't it be nice to have a way of solving this that wasn't so brute force? 
zero momentum reference frame to the rescue. If we knew how to transform into the zero momentum reference frame, in other words, if we knew what the velocity of the zero momentum reference frame was, we would transform into it, right? And so these would become vz, right? Because they're now relative to our zero momentum frame. And the thing is, we now know that this is just zero, which means we can totally ignore the initial, and we could solve for, say, vz bfx. I know a lot of subscripts, but whatever, and it would just be. And that now gives us something much, much simpler that we can substitute into our conservation of energy and solve. If you do that, then you can just call this whole initial energy EI, right? We know everything in here. We can just calculate that. It's a number we can get. And I'll encourage you to work through just doing that substitution and solving for Z VZAFX. And it comes out to this, which is not too bad at all. What's left to do is figure out how to transform into this zero momentum frame. So to find our velocity of the zero momentum frame, we're going to need to know how to transform momentums. We know how to transform all sorts of things, but we haven't figured out yet how to transform a momentum. Well, a momentum involves an inertia, and I've stated without proving it several times that all observers measure the same inertia, but we'd better check that. So we know that we can measure an inertia using a collision, and then the unknown object's inertia will relate to the inertia of some known object, like so. But we know that all observers agree on the delta v's, and so they're all going to agree on the inertia of the unknown object. Phew, it would have been embarrassing if that hadn't worked out, but we're fine. So now let's transform the momentum. And so we don't have to worry about transforming that inertia. And then we know the transformation rule to go from frame A to B for velocities. Now notice that this last term here is just the momentum of this object in frame B. And so there we have it. We have our transformation rule for momentums. Now that we have the momentum transform, we can do what we set out to do. Remember that what we wanted was the velocity of the zero momentum frame so that we can transform into it, because our problem is simpler to solve there. So I'm not going to show you the full derivation because it's a little long. It's in the supplementary videos if you're interested, or you can try and do it yourself. But what you do is you start with the momentum of the whole system, you transform each of those momentums, and after some rearrangement you get this. Recognize that this is the momentum in the zero momentum frame of the system, which means it's zero by definition, and so now we can solve for what we want, which is this, the velocity of the zero momentum frame. We can see one more thing by expanding out this numerator, which looks like this, and this should ring a bell. This is the velocity of the center of mass. So in fact, we already knew how to find the velocity of the zero momentum frame. It's just the velocity of the center of mass. Before returning to solve the problem at last that we're working on, I want you to stop and think about the meaning of this relationship that we just found, because it shows us a reason for something we've already seen. We've seen that the velocity of the center of mass, which we now know is also the velocity of the zero momentum frame, was constant in collisions. Well, is that always true? So let's think about a collision between two cars, and let's say both cars have their brakes applied throughout the collision. So is the center of mass velocity constant in this collision? And I'll give you a big hint. Think about this relationship that we just got and what it tells you. So if you're in the course, Moodle will now ask you this question and you can answer it. Even if you aren't in the course, I would suggest that you think about it and come up with an answer before you proceed to the rest of this video lecture.